All right, friends, it is Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Um, this is Pastor Timo Carbone from Berea United Methodist Church. It is time for our Bible study. We call it Bible Reflection Time. And we've been working on Apostle Paul's uh, first letter to Corinthians. Uh, Assistant Pastor Mary, Mary Miller also here with us this, this noon time. So we are so uh, glad that you have taken time for this study. Now some of you write at this moment and then there are lots of people, I think quite a few people who uh, join with us a little bit later uh, to YouTube. And that is good part of a virtual uh, 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 Bible study because uh, you are not limited to, to, to that one moment of time and day, but you can uh, uh, check in uh, a little bit later and whatever is good time for you. After all, this is time to study. This is time to listen to the Word of God. Uh, I keep on reminding us that we are not here by any means to rewrite the whole Bible. Uh, even sometimes there is in the Bible something that you may wonder if I can say it a little bit differently. But that, after that, it won't be the Word of God anymore if we, we change something. And then the believing in the accuracy of the Bible, um, it's... Um, because it's a big issue, of course, in the field of theology and churches and all that. I believe we are, we have a great uh, reason, big reason to believe that this is a uh, accurate and this is Word of God. And, and you get blessing out of it if you follow the Word of God and try to practice it. And even in the areas that you don't, you don't feel it is easy. Uh, but anyway, let's say a little prayer before we start working on our today's assignment, and then we go from there. Mm -hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that your word is available for us. Even in this hour as we uh, surrender to you, we uh, want you, Lord, to open our hearts and eyes and ears uh, to hear what you are about to say to us as we open your book and as we take a moment to study your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the presence of your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, for blessing uh, all our friends who are joining with us today and then during later days uh, who will be part of this study. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, uh, this is Apostle Paul's uh, first letter to Corinthians, uh, and this is the 11th chapter that we are about to start uh, <coughs> talking a little bit and listening to a little bit. Okay, let's go ahead and start reading. That's the best way to uh, get started. Uh, I think, Mary, we kind of go back to that first verse mm -hmm. um, so that we can get the whole, whole paragraph included. Mm -hmm. Seemed like the first uh, verse of the 11th chapter was... Uh, uh, included in the last with the la of the last verse of the tenth chapter, mm -hmm. and obviously you have to read it anyway, and you have to cover it anyway. But let's go ahead and include it again today, and then okay, how many? Let's do uh, six first verses, I okay. think, <coughs> okay. of this chapter, and then then friends, you'll get you get your Bibles handy and open it up, um, and uh, let's uh, let's start working on our assignment today. Okay. Chapter 11, verse 1 through 6. Yes. And you should imitate me, just as I imitate Christ. I am so glad that you always keep me in your thoughts, and that you are following the teachings I passed on to you. But there is one thing I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. A man dishonors his head if he covers his head while praying or prophesying. But a woman dishonors her head if she prays or prophesies without a covering on her head, for this is the same as shaving her head. Yes, if she refuses to wear a head covering, she should cut off all her hair. But since it is shameful for a woman to have her hair cut or her head shaved, she should wear a covering. All right, thank you. Thank you for the... Um for the reading 
of the first six uh, verses of this chapter. Uh, one thing what, what we are to consider and to remember when we are working on, on Apostle Paul's first letter to Corinthians is that remembering that uh, the, the context matters. Uh, he was writing this letter from Ephesus, uh, about 55, under Domina, to Corinthians, uh, the church that he has started and planted. And <clears throat> it, there was lots of cultural challenges. And let's remember these people were coming out from uh, different uh, cultural uh, context, uh, also from different religious background, including idol worshiping and paganism and 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 Judaism and and you name it, atheism, as uh, I'm, I'm I'm sure. So it was quite a diverse community that was about to come together. Uh, so. You may find when you, or you may hear, and you may see some matters here that uh, you are having kind of somewhat challenging to put together, considering that you know you're putting it together in today's context when you read these lines. So that's something that we need to remember, and also let's remember that, and this is good to good to, good to re, uh, realize is that, for example, this first verse, Mary, uh, and statement what Paul says, as he says that, and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a pretty high statement yes. uh, mm -hmm. uh, to say. But what Paul was saying that uh, you don't have anybody better than, than me. You don't have the Gospels yet. Mm -hmm. Let's remember, they didn't have the Gospel. They didn't have the four Gospels. This was pretty much the only instruction and teaching they were getting at that point. It, well, the Old Testament, obviously. Who was familiar with the Old Testament? Some Jews, of course, were. But uh, the, the Gentiles, uh, obviously, didn't know nothing more about the Old Testament either. Mm -hmm. So Apostle Paul's letter was the only Christian instruction and teaching for these folks. So he was, I don't think it was an arrogant statement from Paul. He was referring that, hey, um, uh, here comes the word of God. Uh, it's been filtered through experiences, and I, I believe this is a, there's a true word of God to you. Mm -hmm. Take it and, and consider it and follow the Lord. Well, he says that you better imitate me just as I imitate Christ saying that I am not after anything of myself, but I'm trying to teach you what might be Christ's will for you. So, mm -hmm. uh, okay. So Mary, the, the, there's lots of, lots of us to cover. Are you uh, specializing on, 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 <coughs> on these matters? And you explain it, you know, where is the man? It, it, it is putting a uh, man pre, on the pretty high stand here. Uh, and then ladies following that, mm -hmm. uh, if you read it first time, but when we start breaking it down, uh, let's talk about it a little bit. So what, what is your take on this? Well, I, I went ahead and looked at the, the message to see what it, oh. what it said. Um, and I, I brought that along because I, I was- There's lots of I writings I was wondering here. the same thing, but, um, or I was just trying to think about it. and. This breaks it down between, uh, you know, the message is usually done in paragraphs. Yeah. So this first paragraph is uh, up through verse 9. Uh -huh. so, um, so let me just read that. What, what, this is what the message says, which is, uh, it's not the same as a translation. It's, a, it's more, uh, it takes concepts rather than words and um, tries to bring the context, or the, uh, yeah, the context for the, the general meaning into uh, clearer modern day English. <clears throat> so this says, it pleases me that you continue to re remember and honor me by keeping up the traditions of the faith I taught you. All actual authority stems from Christ, which is the part you just had read. Mm -hmm. 
In a marriage relationship, there is authority from Christ to husband and from husband to wife. The authority of Christ is the authority of God. Any man who speaks with God or about God in a way that shows a lack of respect for the authority of Christ dishonors Christ. In the same way, a wife who speaks with God in a way that shows a lack of respect for the authority of her husband dishonors her husband. Worse, she dishonors herself. An ugly sight, like a woman with her head shaved. This is basically the origin of these customs we have of women wearing head coverings in worship while men take, off, take their hats off. By these symbolic acts, men and women who far too often butt heads with each other submit their heads to the head, God. So that's his take on it. I'm not sure that answers a lot of our questions, but I thought it was interesting. Um, it, some, interesting it did some and then it created some additional <laughs> yeah, questions. So that's, that's, a, that's always what happened, but yeah. thank you for reading it. Um, I think the key word here is the word submission. Uh, submission doesn't, we, uh, doesn't mean that you uh, surrender all your, uh, everything that you are under somebody and, and you don't have no uh, will or uh, 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 nothing to say about anything. Sometimes uh, people read it that way and saying that uh, it is all about men and women should be quiet and women should be just a uh, behaving well so that they please the authority which is men only. I think the key word, key words or key uh, teaching here is the right submission. So as we submit our lives under Christ, there needs to be a, a mutual commitment and cooperation uh, between uh, husband and wife, between men and women. Uh, I think that's, that is something that we can, we can take uh, uh, from this teaching and now he when he's talking about uh, uh, covering your hair or cutting your hair not doing that I think it has some so much to do part of it has something to do with the culture but also uh, one part uh, there's there's actually I barely never hardly never read this footnotes here but it's uh, that is that is not what I'm teaching you it's a good any any in inspirational reading is good along with the Bible but don't that don't put that inspirational reading before the Word of God you can use it to kind of open windows and, uh, and stimulate your understanding about about the, the scripture but don't always take it as a clear and solid and final explanation they are thoughtful words but uh, they can replace the reading itself itself so I'm going to read a little bit but let, let's cover these two additional verses here Mary and then we um, actually let's 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 do it uh, cover all the way to uh, from seven now all the way through eleven, and then we can take a break from there. Or twelve? Yes. Eleven or twelve? My my paragraph ends at twelve, so should we do twelve? Yes, twelve. Okay. Twelve. A man should not wear anything on his head when worshiping, for man is made in God's image and reflects God's glory, and woman reflects man's glory. For the first man didn't come from woman, but the first woman came from man. And man was not made for woman, but woman was made for man. For this reason, and because the angels are watching, a woman should wear a covering on her head to show she is under authority. But among the Lord's people, women are not independent of men, and men are not independent of women. For although the first woman came from man, every other man was born from a woman, and everything comes from God. Yeah, it is getting easier for us to understand uh, somewhere here in the 11 or 12th chapter. Uh, there are strength uh, in men and there is strength in women. And there shouldn't be a conflict between the strength. And, and there's not, there shouldn't be a hard competition which one is ruling the day or which one is, uh, which one is the, 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 the head of the family today. Or, uh, sometimes that can pick the case. Let's listen to what this footnote uh, 
says, and it kind of helps us to open up it maybe a little bit. God created lines of authority in order for his created world to function smoothly. Although there must be lines of authority even in marriage, there should not be lines of superiority. God created men and women with unique and com complementary characteristics. One sex is not better than the other. We must not let the issue of authority and submission become a wedge to destroy oneness in marriage. Instead, we should use our unique gifts to strengthen our marriages and to glorify God. And we can extend this statement, this footnote statement, uh, also for the church body. Uh, I know there are denominations who are pretty strict and they are trading their statement, their understanding uh, to the Bible. They're saying that um, there's no room for female leadership in the church. And then they are referring uh, to the very scriptures of this uh, 11th uh, uh, chapter of the Apostle Paul's first letter to Corinthians, which is amazing, amazing thing to me. It's, it's, a, it's, just a, it's just a wrong interpretation. That's what it is. Or if not wrong, but poor interpretation. Now, uh, because uh, God created something that would benefit the unity in the marriage and the ministry in the church mm -hmm. for us to glorify Christ. I know for sure, and everybody hopefully will agree with me, that there are some matters, for example, talking about male and female concept that uh, I believe men can do better. And they can be, uh, they see things that uh, in the light so that they can they can, they can benefit the unity in the church and the unity in the marriage uh, by their character and by their gift. And this, at the same time, you can say that there are things that uh, uh, women, females, they see it better. They see it better. And by doing it, by allowing doing it, they will benefit their uh, marriage and, and church ministry uh, better uh, with their gifts, God's giving gifts. And we need to allow that to happen. We need to allow, I, I guess that's one thing here that Paul said, there, there is an order, there is a, there's an order, there are lines of authority, there are, there, there, is, uh, there is something about this creation that we need to honor. But it, it is not being created to conflict each other, uh, but by promoting promoting the leadership and promoting character, characteristics and promoting gifts and talents uh, to bring greater unity and strength for the church and for, for the marriage as well. Mm -hmm. And that is not an easy thing to do, mm -hmm. considering how much disappointments and conflicts there is uh, in, in marriages. Uh, and, and also in, in, in church ministries easily uh, because uh, we, we are having a hard time to see it from, from that perspective. I'd say that this is probably the big picture we are to see. Mm -hmm. This is probably the, the thing that Paul is really after. And when it comes to hairstyle here, I don't want us to go very deep in this, this subject for certain reasons that I am not that interested about hairstyle. I think that Dr. Ralph is agreeing with me that the hairstyle doesn't matter, am I right? No matter at all. But in this concept, when I think we need to clarify something here, uh, when he was talking about uh, a woman's hair being short or long, mm -hmm. there, there, there is some cultural right. issues here that right. always, is there a need to be considered? And, and I think we want to discuss that a little bit more. Anything else, Mary, about this this matter here? Well, there is a, a footnote that also refers to that woman uh, woman having a short hair and things like that. Also, that I'll share part of. Um, uh, 
So it's uh, the section of Paul's letter focuses mainly on irreverence in worship. We need to read it in the context of the situation in Corinth. The matter of wearing hats or head coverings, although seemingly insignificant, had become a big problem because two cultural backgrounds were colliding. Jewish women always covered their heads in worship. For a woman to uncover her head in public was a sign of loose morals in that, in that culture. On the other hand, Greek women may have been used to worshiping without head coverings. Um, so that's part of the cultural context is what you're saying. Yes. Uh, and uh, then it, he just finishes earlier in this letter, Paul had already spoken about divisions and disorder in the church. Both are involved in this issue. Paul's solution came from his desire for unity among church members and for appropriateness in worship services. Mm -hmm. So I guess, again, this particular discussion of head coverings and, and long and short hair is, is a response to an issue that's problematic in the Corinthian church that he's trying to yeah. bring to um, a place of uh, unity, of ironing it out. So, so it's in that reason that he's even brought it up, I think. Yeah, that is true. Mm -hmm. The cultural context is very important. Now, this is not to say that it has been used as a uh, as a doctrine, doctrinal church doctrine for for a, the whole denomination in, in many ways. It, it, it has been, and I, I think that is still true. I mean, I, I'm not uh, underestimating or criticizing anybody's church doctrine, I think we have enough to do with that as a Methodist, but, but, a, uh, so, but we may have hard time to see that this was an ideal, uh, this would be an ideal, um, uh, the, um, a right teaching for us today that literally following what Paul says when it comes to uh, wearing hair, uh, hair covers and, and, and and, 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 and the, uh, uh, everything related to your hairstyle, I think uh, it may not be the most important thing, but in that context, it was very important. Mm -hmm. In that context, it was, it was very important. Uh, and it comes very more clear here as we keep on reading from the, uh, let's go ahead and read from the uh, 13th through uh, 15th verse, so it comes. Okay kind of adding on something about this very same thing. Judge for yourselves. Is it right for a woman to pray to God in public without covering her head? Isn't it obvious that it's disgraceful for a man to have long hair? And is it long hair a woman's pride and joy? For it has been given to her as a covering. But if anyone wants to argue about this, I simply say that we have no other custom than this, and neither do God's other churches. Yeah. Isn't it obvious? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, if you were uh, part of uh, Corinthian church at that time, it would be you obvious. would find it very, very useful teaching if you were sitting in that pew at yes. that time. Mm -hmm. Now, to us, being 2,000 years, um, coming 2,000 years afterwards, and being Christian believers in this culture, we, we may find it uh, overwhelming challenge things to start following this teaching mm -hmm. right in our context mm -hmm. and saying what is this has what it what does it what it what this has to do about my faith today and that would be a good question <laughs> whether i'm wearing a uh, little bit longer hairstyle i'm covering my hair as i come to church wearing a hat as pretty as it is or pulling that hat down and just letting my hair blow and blow, uh, and that would be a good question. So that gives us reason to believe that this uh, this teaching was very contextual yes. teaching uh, for for that uh, audience there. We, we've been reading these uh, head notes today probably more than ever before during this uh, about a year Bible study, close to a year Bible mm -hmm. study, I guess, uh, as we have started. Uh, let me continue reading this head notes, uh, footnotes, I'm sorry, uh, head or footnotes, but anyway, 
There are footnotes about heads. That's right. This <laughs> this is this is now the tenth verse, and it, it covers actually uh, fourteen and fifteen. It says. Uh, talking about the 10th verse uh, is already a little bit behind. The verse says, For this reason and because the angels are watching, a woman should wear a covering on her head to show she's under authority. And they, here is the footnote saying, This verse may, be, <coughs> may mean that the woman should wear a covering on her hair, on her head, as a sign that she is under the man's authority. This is fact even uh, the angels understand as they observe. Observe Christians in worship. See the note on the uh, 11. Let me read a little bit. Uh, in talking about head coverings and length of hair, Paul is saying that believers should look and behave in ways that are honorable in their own culture. In many cultures, long hair on men is considered appropriate and masculine. In Corinth, it was thought to be a sign of male prostitution in the, in the, pagan, temp, in the pagan temples. And women with short hair were labeled prostitutes. So Paul was saying that in the Corinthian culture, Christian women should keep their hair long. In short hair, if short hair on women was a sign of prostitution, then a Christian woman with, uh, with short hair would find it difficult to be believable witness for Jesus Christ. So it, it's making sense that again, this, this teaching of uh, Paul was, was a very context, uh, contextual teaching. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that the people who were listening to it, it made lots of sense. Mm -hmm. uh, even to us, it may, if you take it literally, saying that what should I do with my hair after this Bible study, to, well, what should I do with my hair? I would say that's your business. Do whatever you want is pleasing to you to decorate yourself as, mm -hmm. as you want. Uh, whether you want to cut it short, you want to let it grow a little bit longer, you want to put some waves on it, uh, <laughs> to what you please is to you. So I think that covers it all, am I right? I think so. And let's move on. Uh, Paul changes his, his topic. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are talking about the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And this is, this is, seems like a somewhat, somewhat troublesome, uh, in the church, uh, to, to namely to celebrate Lord's Supper, the communion, the Eucharist, um, correctly, instead of believing that that was just uh, part of something that they can do it any way they can. So let's go ahead and start reading, Mary. This uh, this is kind of one big thing. So we are having probably hard time to kind of uh, cut it short, but. Let's do, let's do so that we start from the 17 verses, friends, of the 11th chapter, and we go all the way to the 26th verse, and then we see what is there. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Let's pay attention. This is a pretty lengthy paragraph we are working on now. But in, the following, it's, but in the following instructions, I cannot praise you, for it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you meet together. First... I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet as a church, and to some extent I believe it. But of course, there must be divisions among you so that you who have God's approval will be recognized. When you meet together, you are, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. What, don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Okay, thank you. Uh, if it was useful to teach about uh, this behavior, behavioral matters and uh, matters on uh, between men and women and appearances of these uh, both, I think it was at least as important for Paul to teach about how to celebrate correctly the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. There seemed to be some confusion or lack of instruction in, among the Corinthian church um, how to do it right. Mm -hmm. And I think this is married the way I see it after being involved in the ministry for quite some time is that uh, as often as, as we offer people an opportunity to celebrate the Holy Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, or the, the Holy Communion, that there needs to be instruction one way or another. Of course, instruction comes by reading the Gospel. Uh, and as we bless the elements of bread and wine, but sometimes uh, additional advice on what is the right tradition to do it, what is the right way to do it. When there are people involved, I don't know, Mary, why it has to be so, that uh, it, it ends to be that there's always right way to do it and wrong way to do it. And both parties believe that I'm doing it right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But as a Christian believers, thank you, Jesus, for that, we have instructions that is permanent. Mm -hmm. We can go by. And we should have always room to say that, hey, wait a minute, let's check it out. I am not quite sure about it. Let's check it out. And here is the moment for us, too, to see uh, what is the right way to do it. Uh, can we do it this way, and can we do it that way? And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and I, I think it's always... But for the church members in the Corinthian church, it seemed like there was a real reason for Paul to address about these matters. Because there was probably lots of unknown, there's lots of confusion, and there's lots of... Um, not spiritual freedom, but probably a fleshly freedom taken mm -hmm. from different individuals there to, to celebrate it my way without making any separation from anything you might call it ordinary. And this is now teaching coming to their way and obviously it's coming to our way as well. Mm -hmm. As Paul says, but in the following instructions, I cannot praise you. Uh, that was kind of... Pretty straightforward, yeah. Very, very straightforward statement that guys you are you don't know what you are doing mm -hmm. you really don't know what you are doing uh, shame on you and then uh, for it sounds I have heard as if more harm that good is done when you meet together mm -hmm. so that's a pretty sad yeah. pretty sad statement mm -hmm. for somebody who was the founder of the church an apostle hearing that there's a Christian community there that I know so well. As a matter of fact, most of the people I may know and I have, I have been the father of faith for many of them. What I'm hearing, the word gets to me that when you come together, you are causing more harm than doing any good for yourself and for, for your fellow church members. So how bad it was, how bad it can be, how much worse it can be than that. And almost saying that it might be good for you to stay home if you can do better than this. <laughs> so it was good and it was useful for Paul to give some instruction. Right, right. And here's where it comes. Uh, well, there was divisions. Mm -hmm. There was uh, controversies. There was a, uh, fights, obviously, on between opinion over the very issue of Lord's Supper and the, and the service itself. Yeah, yeah. Maybe somebody said that I don't want to hear the choir anymore, I want praise band. Or somebody <laughs> saying, no, I want, I want choir, I don't want to hear praise band. Somebody saying, I don't want... I think you just jumped into the 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I was I was a uh, right twenty first. I don't want to have soloists. I want to have just him singing. And then there is a big fight over this issue. And then we hit, need to hear Paul saying that hey hey, no no no, that's not the way way to do it. Okay, what was the problem, Mary? Here, what all were the problems? Uh, I don't think they have. It, 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 the music hasn't been listed here, but no, uh, there was probably other issues going on. Well, I, again, something that is uh, to understand because of context is that <clears throat> they would gather together and have like a, a love feast mm -hmm. um, before they would celebrate communion, and I think that's part of what's being discussed here, where he says. Um, uh, number tw uh, verse 20 when you meet together you're not really interested in the Lord's Supper for some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others as a result some go hungry while others get drunk so I think that's referring to the um, the the fellowship meal before mm -hmm. the, the Lord's Supper and mm -hmm. that and that people are just focused on on that and having a good time and just feeding themselves and not even looking to see if others have food at all to eat. Mm -hmm. um, so it starts up, it starts up pretty, pretty rough mm -hmm. um, before they even get to the part of um, sharing in the Lord's Supper. Um, and he's telling them his advice in verse 22 is, don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Mm -hmm. um, so he is just saying when you come together, that's not the right attitude. You mm -hmm. should have the attitude of being um, of coming together in fellowship and in, in uh, being con considerate of your brothers and sisters and in um, sharing your food with those who need it and then um, bringing unity so yes uh -huh. that, that is so very very right and <clears throat> expressing his his sadness and disappointment he says Paul this is Paul saying what I'm what I'm supposed to say. Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, there, are, there are issues and, and, and concerns for Paul that uh, the church was not doing very well uh, while meeting. And then when it comes to an issue on celebrate the Holy Communion, now, we have reason to believe that in the early church, in the early Christianity, uh, the services were long and big gatherings, including eating together, mm -hmm. and then in also separating the Lord's Supper together. And this was the format, uh, pretty much. And then there is Bible study, and there is a singing, and psalm singing, and, and then later hymn singing. But they were not only one hour gatherings, Mary. Mm -hmm. They were... Right they last much longer than that and uh, so um, when your gathering takes time many issues can be involved mm -hmm. and, and that was probably the case but then comes Paul's teaching about the sacrament about the Lord's Supper and it, it starts here in the verse 23 mm -hmm. as he says for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself so this is where the authority of the apostles come. Apostle comes into picture. Right, right. I am not talking something on myself, from myself. Here is the word for you to follow. And I'm sure that at that time, by that time, everybody start listening to uh, his words. Namely, on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. Now this is a, a direct quotation, quote, quote, excuse me, uh, to the gospel. Mm -hmm. This is exactly the words of Jesus Paul is referring to. His words, Paul's words, in the same way he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. So, uh, Paul reminded this is 
needs to be uh, separated from, from your love meal or supper or a meal together. This mm -hmm. is now the Lord's Supper. This is not to celebrate our fellowship only or have discussion over matters, but this is now to remember Jesus only. Yes. This is the Lord's Supper, the Holy Eucharist, the Holy Communion. This is, this is the heart of our worship. And of course, it has been discussed, and there's always reason to discuss whether how often the Lord's Supper was celebrated in the early church context and early Christianity. And, and denominations who are chasing it to a, their custom or their tradition to celebrate Holy Eucharist, Holy Lord's Supper every time when they have services, have reason to believe that that's what the early church did. Mm -hmm. Every time when they have gatherings, every time where they have worship, they have the Lord's Supper as well. In Roman Catholicism and in Orthodox uh, tradition, uh, coming coming back to a uh, uh, Anglican Church or uh, or uh, even to more Protestant denominations, Christian Church. Uh, I know there are several others. They really believe that every time when there is a worship, there needs to be the Lord's Supper as well. And I am, I am pretty firm believer in that myself. I would uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper more often than we do. Now we believe that once a month is kind of the uh, the schedule we follow, and that's that's good. I think it could happen much more often than that. I think it would be good to have it weekly. Uh, you may have other services uh, more often than once a week, but uh, the service where we um, where we uh, where we receive the the Lord's Supper, I think it should be weekly at least. Going back to our church father John Wesley, he celebrates Holy Communion as often as, taken literally, the Lord's Word as often as possible, and mm -hmm. and the year. I believe we have reason to believe that it was at least four or five days a week he received the Holy Communion. And he believed it was every time uh, greater and greater celebration mm -hmm. for him. Mm -hmm. And I believe there's lots of truth there. But this was what Paul was teaching Corinthians, mm -hmm. doing it right way. Not arguing over issues, not uh, messing with food, but the Lord's Supper needs to be separated from anything else. Mm -hmm. It is his, his Supper, remembering Him and Him only. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go ahead and finish this reading, Mary, uh, beginning from verse 27 all the way to the uh, verse of 33, okay. 34. Mm -hmm. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So, my dear brothers and sisters, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. If you are really hungry, eat at home so you won't bring judgment upon yourselves when you meet together. I'll give you instructions about the other matters after I arrive. Okay, thank you for reading. Um, Paul was saying, according to this last verse, 34th uh, verse, that, okay, there's more coming. There's more, There's more to, to it. it. More to <laughs> yes. it. More Always to more it. to it. And I think this is very, very, very useful uh, teaching, even to us today. I know that Paul has a big reason to uh, to say um, pretty straightforward words about wrong uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper wrong way and celebrating it the right way. And because it needs to be separated from anything else we do in the life of the church, talking about Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, 
Paul said that keep it that way. Don't get mixed with anything else. Keep it that way. Uh, make sure your understanding is clear. Your your behavior is reverent. You understand the seriousness, the joyful seriousness about this act of worship. Keep it separated. Keep it sacred. Keep it holy. Uh, uh, study and pay attention your, on your attitude and your mind. Focus on Christ. Uh, forgive is forgiveness is needed. Uh, and, and, and take time for it. Don't just rush it through. And that is maybe something I would like to do a little preaching here that uh, uh, has hurt me personally when, when, uh, when, when we serve the Holy Communion, and it is it means that it will extend our service time a little bit. Mm -hmm. The service obviously will be a little bit longer. Right. If you follow the full liturgy and readings and and responsive readings, and then the blessing and consecrating the elements and all that, it will add on some. It will add on some, and then. When what I have seen, not here, but I have seen in the past ministries that that people who are so busy they don't even have time to stay for the for the Lord's Supper, even if it's a once a month. So they are so busy and they're checking their wants and checking the time, and I don't have time for this. And you 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 feel sorry. It makes you sad. You're almost tempted to ask, well, do you have time when the Lord calls you to come, go to heaven? Do you have time for that? And you want him to extend that time. Mm -hmm. There's no much negotiating over that issue. Now, when the Lord comes so close to you, offering uh, his body and his blood, saying, and I have done this for you, and you say, I don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. I walk away. Yeah. I Which think it's, I think it's uh, partly because of um, not really getting it. <laughs> not real folks who would, who would leave sure. before the, mm -hmm. the time, um, just because of time constraints, that they're, they're not really in their hearts understanding what a gift it is and what, what a uh, huge means of grace that, that receiving the Lord's Supper is. Um, and, but I have seen that even here in the past, um, that uh, there have been some families who it was kind of their practice on communion Sundays to, to leave before communion was served. And um, yeah, it, it's it's beyond me. Sad. Yeah, it's sad. it's sad. This is why we have teaching here before us, and if Paul had reason to teach, uh, his church and he loved so dearly. Mm -hmm. he, 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 was, he was a father to the church. He founded, he planted a church. A guy's here are the words you please take these two consideration. I think teaching when we celebrate the Holy Eucharist, uh, Holy Communion, teaching needs to go along with that mm -hmm. on practicalities, right, right. on our attitude uh, to see in it right way and to see this isn't my opportunity. I remember I used to have a co-worker and I uh, can hear at this point him repeating these word, words if he was serving, it was my assistant, he was a great guy always saying when we did uh, work together he said that uh, i have come to conclusion that i will never get closer to the lord in this life except through the holy communion mm -hmm. when people say i wish to get close to the to the lord closer to the lord mm -hmm. and he was saying that you can't get closer than this in this life right but celebrating the Holy Communion, the sacrament, the Lord's Supper. Here it is. Here is everything you need. Here it is. And I I would like to confirm that statement. Mm -hmm. And I believe uh, from my heart in the sacramental uh, Christianity. I believe that that is a gift from the Lord. Uh, and I honor everybody's tradition, the way you do it, the way we do it. Um, that's the way to do it. But there's always reason for us to learn more about it. Mm -hmm. And as a leaders, as a pastoral leaders, as we lead our congregation in this uh, service, I think the deeper we are 
in this, the more our service will bless our congregation. And that is my prayer every time when I'm leading our, our congregation in the communion service. Despite of what people may think that we are running one or two minutes or five minutes over, whatever that over yes, is, over is. <laughs> so that I, I, uh, people will find me faithful in serving and trying to lead my, my fellow uh, church members mm -hmm. as deep as I understand instead of praying the Holy mm -hmm. Communion and the Lord's Supper. And mm -hmm. This is the point here yes. mm -hmm. of Apostle Paul's leading his dear congregation as deep as he can uh, to, in celebrating the Holy Communion to get the full blessing out of it and what is more important. Okay, uh, Mary, you have any, anything else on this? I think it would be good to talk for a minute about verse 27 because mm -hmm. I think that's a, a verse that um, maybe, maybe needs some light shed on it. Okay. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. The reason I say that is um, I was on a, a mission trip many, many years ago to uh, Kenya. And one of the churches that we, um, that we joined in worship when we were traveling there was um, they, they were experiencing that many of the Kenyans... Uh, who were uh, in there that they were trying to bring into their congregation um, would choose not to take communion because they felt like they were unworthy of it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I think this verse can mean, can be misunderstood sometimes. Um, so I don't know. Um, I think what, what he goes on to say is, well, first of all, we have to remember what he was talking about beforehand, mm -hmm. that people were um, just not even, uh, they were just eating their love feast and they weren't really even focusing on the Lord's Supper. So that's part of what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. But he's also talking about um, uh, examining yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup, asking for forgiveness, asking God to... Um, to cleanse you of your sin. So in reality, nobody's ever worthy mm -hmm. of eating the Lord's, uh, the, the body and blood of the Lord, but only through his forgiveness and through his mm -hmm. grace are we worthy. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I, I think that's a verse that can um, uh, be taken in a wrong way sometimes. Yeah. I think if you are worried about being worthy, <laughs> if you worry, there's nothing wrong about that. Yeah. If you are right way worried, get after that you are receiving it. Mm -hmm. But I think Paul is referring here, what I mentioned earlier, the way I see it, he's referring to his, this attitude check. Yes. You better mm -hmm. check your attitude. Uh, uh, that the, uh, are you being disrespectful? Right. To really understand what you are about to receive. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can't throw Jesus Christ away. Right. You can't push him away and put in something else instead. So he was referring to this attitude check. Mm -hmm. and, and then, yeah, nobody is perfect enough to receive the, the sacrament or grace. It is a gift. But, um, and that is, that is something that uh, good pastoral care needs to be included also, that if there's somebody here who's wondering whether I'm worth it to receive and you feel sorry about matters and you feel that uh, you don't fulfill the measure mm -hmm. you don't fulfill the standards uh, this is specially for you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because there's all, only one person who can uh, fill it up for you right, right. who can cover it for you and this is why he came mm -hmm. this okay. is the reason for us to receive the sacrament that we, we realize that mm -hmm. there's nothing in me to uh, fulfill that standards, but Christ comes. But then uh, I, I think that is the attitude that is that is okay mm -hmm. and very good and useful. Yeah, yeah. But then if you really uh, are being disrespectful, that that time thing, uh, having no time for it, may have That's something to do with what yeah. Paul is after here. Yeah. 
says plainly walking away and I don't have time for this and why it always take communion service a little longer I don't have time lunch is waiting and I have something else to do mm -hmm. so yeah. people who have a little bit this kind of attitude probably need to, need to read these lines carefully and then put their hand and fingers on their heart and say Lord is there something that I need to check yeah I need yeah. to look into and and right. that's that's I think what Paul is trying to mm -hmm. say here there's or a, say in here. Yes. There's a, a part of the uh, communion liturgy in the Catholic Church that I remember mm. from my growing up years, and it is, uh, Lord, I'm unworthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. Yeah. That yeah. was that was like always Beautiful one of my favorite um, mm -hmm. par favorite parts of the mm -hmm. of the liturgy of the Mass. Yeah. I'm unworthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. Yeah. Um, that is a beautiful way. Yeah way to uh, to conclude what Paul was saying here uh, good what is good father good father is the father who is being honest and and saying sometimes things uh, to us to me and to everyone that may not be pleasing to us but they may sure correcting us and helping us to find the truth and, and when it comes to communion, I think that's what Paul was exercising, being a mm -hmm. good father for, for his church. Right. Good apostle, good teacher, good pastor for his church. That guy, only intention I have is to, uh, to bless you and to correct you mm -hmm. and, and, and to, um, to make sure that you can receive the grace as, it, as you should and as you can. And yeah. that's, a, that's a beautiful, way to see it. Okay, friends, uh, we are so thankful. Time always flies. Uh, it does. Uh, we are so thankful that you have been with us today, and we keep on working on our assignment next time. It will be chapter 12. It's not going to be next Wednesday because I will be uh, out of town uh, a little break, uh, and uh, Mary could do it on her own easily. But the, um, I guess we take a break, and then we are going to take a break maybe once or twice in August as well. Right, right. We will get back on that a little bit later. Once we get back, we start talking about when we cancel the game. <laughs> but the, um, so not this coming Wednesday, but on the following Wednesday, which is now August 4th, Fourth, I think. Fourth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are coming back, so you are a little bit longer time to read. And you may need that time because ne next chapter is, uh, again, a uh, very joyful reading, talking mm -hmm. about spiritual gifts. Yep. And, yep. and read it prayerfully mm -hmm. and, and write down questions for yourself. And hopefully uh, you will find some answers as we are discussing and talking, reflecting upon these readings. Uh, go in very deep theologically. Uh, I don't think in this kind of format, whether it's good or not, we may, and we are not trying to be uh, saying anything too profound. What I mean, that's something that's hard to understand. I think we try to keep it practical and following the readings. And, and we are asking God's Holy Spirit to, uh, to uh, keep us passion and clearance on matters. And, and, and again, being faithful to the reading not trying to make it more complicated than it can be sometimes, but on the other hand, being respectful and, and clear that we say what we believe we know, not saying anything that we are not certain whether it is, it is right or not. And there's always re, uh, uh, need for every teacher to, to, to say that uh, here's how I understand it, here's how I see it. And then, then saying by saying that uh, continuing study uh, needed. Mm -hmm. And as I put it, there's more, always more to it. <laughs> Thank you guys. I'm going to ask Mary to please lead us in prayer as we conclude this study today. All right. Our Heavenly Father, I just pause for a minute and just say thank you. Thank you for choosing to come to us in such a wonderful and blessed way as, as Holy Communion. Um, 
help us to not take it lightly or to take it um, flippantly, but to always be thankful and to always realize that we are not worthy of your blessings, but you make it so. You make it so that we can receive them. So Father, I thank you for this teaching of Paul, but I also thank you for, for all that this uh, means for us today in our, in our walk following you and um, being your disciples. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, thank you friends. God bless you, gonna see you later. Keep on reading.